And one of the things that I've observed that has happened recently that I want to address because I want to bring the truth of God's Word on the matter is this movie called Noah. <laughs> now, this movie is so crazy that it makes Noah crazy. <laughs> that he's hearing voices when God actually spoke to him. And worst of all, it makes God appear harsh, mean. And right at the end, you know, when, when, when uh, Noah could not do the, the, the evil task of killing his family that is not found in the Bible, it's as if he's more merciful than God. In the first place, God never asked him to kill any of his family. This is Hollywood, not Holy Word. God told him to save his entire family. Not only that, the Bible says God, God had him as a preacher of righteousness. All those 50 to 70 years that the ark was in, in building, he was preaching. Yep. Yep. That's right. But the world was so wicked, they didn't respond to his preaching. God always extends chance after chance, opportunity after opportunity. Yep. And I, I hate the misrepresentation of my God in that movie. Right. So I'm here to tell you, all right, there are Christians opposed to this. There are Christians who say this is poetic license. Let me tell you what's poetic license. Poetic license never take away from the character, the basic essence of the character. You know, uh, the movie, The Passion of the Christ, that's par excellence. There is poetic license, you know, when you see the boy fell down, Jesus as the boy, when he fell down and his mother ran to him. Do you remember that? That's poetic license. That's not in the Bible, but that could have happened. And it was so appropriate because, you know, it really tugged at our heartstrings as parents. That was one of the best scenes in the movie. Now, that's poetic license, but it never takes away from the character of Jesus or the mother. But this poetic license is too much. Amen? Amen. So let me tell you the story. Of, I, I, I'm not going to talk about the movie no more, okay? Unless it comes across in my sermon or whatever. But I'm going to tell you the truth about Noah because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, it's going to be exactly the same scenario. First of all, you must understand the promise. Understand the promise. The very first promise is a prophecy. And it's a prophecy of all prophecies. It is the promise of all the promise. And this is the promise in Genesis 3, verse 15. God said, to Satan, who was now in the embodiment of the snake. Adam and Eve have just been tempted to sin, and they sin. They have fallen. Now God is addressing Satan. God is addressing the enemy. And God said this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed, Satan's seed, and her seed, capital S. Who is her seed? Our Lord Jesus. We know that women don't have seed. Man provides the seed. So this is a prophecy of virgin birth, that Jesus will be born as the woman's seed. He shall bruise, this Hebrew word for bruise is crush. He, the Messiah, will crush your head, and you will crush his heel. Which is better, crush heel or crush head? In crushing Satan's head, he would crush his heel. And that's a picture of his dying on the cross to save all of us. So the devil heard this from the mouth of God himself, that the Messiah will come, the dragon slayer, the serpent crusher is going to come from the woman. So straight when Adam and Eve had children, Cain and Abel, the devil and John confirms it, John says, the apostle John says, Cain, who was of the wicked one, all right? He, he was open to the devil and his suggestions. Cain was, was uh, uh, recruited by the devil because the devil doesn't know. The devil is not omniscient. He doesn't, doesn't know when Jesus is going to come. He thought that immediately the woman's seed is going to be the Savior. So when the two brothers, Cain and Abel, offered to God, one offered blood sacrifice, the other offered uh, salad dressing, vegetables, 
And knowing full well, both brothers knew full well that God said, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And yet, Cain's sacrifice was a bloodlust sacrifice. And then the Bible says God favored Abel. God had respect unto Abel and his sacrifice. Remember this, when you come to God with an unblemished lamb, God has respect to you because of the lamb that you bring. God does not check you out. God checks your lamb out. It is not how good you are. It is how good your lamb is. Amen. Amen. God checks your lamb out. Our lamb is our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I have a good amen? So obviously the devil saw the favor of God on Abel and he thought that Abel was the woman's seed that would crush his head. Hence, the murderous campaign started. All right, he had his brother Cain, jealous of his brother Abel. So the first murder is over religion. Both brothers approached God, but one approached God his way, the other approached God his own way. One is God's way, one is man's way. And Cain killed Abel. And the devil said, got it? God's word cannot come to pass. I'm safe. Nobody's going to crush my head. Okay? And then he found out later on that Abel wasn't the one. So let's go to the story right now of uh, Genesis 6. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth, Nephilim. Nephilim in Hebrew means from the word nafal, fall, fallen ones. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And also afterwards. I have this underlined so that you will know there were two eruptions of uh, fallen angels coming to the daughters of men. Okay? When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of all men of renown. Mighty in the sense of mighty in size, superhuman size and strength, and mighty in wickedness. Go back to verse 2. Verse 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. Who are the sons of God and the daughters of men? Notice the, 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 the division here. Daughters of men. Sons of God. Let me tell you, Bible must interpret Bible. All right? The daughters of men are just women, okay, of mankind. Women, just like normal women, born from Adam's stock. But sons of God, who are they? In the Septuagint version, which is the Greek version of the Scriptures in the Old Testament, this word here are angels, angelos. Not God's angels, angels that came from God, but they fell. How did they fall? With Lucifer, who became Satan. All right? That fall is mentioned in Isaiah, and it was long before God created men. So one third of the angels followed Lucifer, Satan. Okay, so God has two thirds, but these fallen angels, they did something. Now, let me prove to you real fast, okay? Uh, they are actually, Bible interpret Bible, they are actually angels. Some people argue that these uh, the sons of God are actually uh, the line of uh, Cain or, or things like that. They are not humans. They are angels. Okay, the question is asked, can angels, do angels have bodies like men? No, don't forget, the Bible says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For some have entertained angels unaware. Angels can take the body of a man and appear like a man. In fact, in terms of sex, all right, they, uh, we say they are sexless, but actually they are always presented in the Bible as men. They are not supposed to, do, to abuse that position, but this happened back in Noah's time. All right, let me prove to you the sons of God are angels. Uh, why sons of God? Beni ha Elohim in Hebrew, sons of God. Because anyone created directly by God is called sons of God. We are sons of God in the same way that Jesus, all right, is the son of God. We are not the only begotten. We are sons of God. Jesus is the only begotten. He's fully God, fully man. We are, we are fully man, amen, 
born as sons of God into the family of God. Now, these angels don't have. They don't have the position that of family sons of God. But sons of God means uh, they are created by God directly. Like Adam was called son of God. Do you know that? Because he was created directly. After that, uh, men come together with the uh, marriage uh, relationship and produce children. So they are not like direct creation of God. Anyone direct creation is called sons of God. Not in the family sense that you and I are in the family of God today. Are you with me so far? In Job 1, when, when the angels presented themselves to God, Job 1 says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Notice that? Satan is a fallen angel. He also came. Job 38, when God talked about the creation, he says, when the morning stars sang together, we have proven that stars can emit music. Right? And all the sons of God shouted for joy. During creation, who were the sons of God? Angels. So back to Genesis 6 again. Are you all with me so far? So what happened was that the devil was out to corrupt the woman's seed. Because if he can corrupt the woman's seed, he can secure his position. Are you with me so far? So what happened uh, uh, before Noah's flood? Don't forget, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Adam was still around because Adam died in, in his 930th year. Back in those days, they lived long, long lives. This antediluvian. They lived long lives. So during that time, what happened was the fallen angels, Satan instigating it, came to the daughters of man, all right? They took on the form of a man and had sex with the daughters of man, producing Nephilim. Weird. Now today, we have a corrupt, corrupted version handed down from Greek mythology. But Greek mythology have pictures of giants, all right? Now, we say that, oh, it's just fables and all that. But actually, some, someone back then, all right, even during Alexandra's time and, and beyond that, they still remember there were giants on the earth. Hercules and all that kind of thing. They call them demigods. We have a picture of one. Cyclops. Weird. There were giants in those days, Nephilim, from the word Nafal in Hebrew, fallen ones. Back to Genesis 6 again. There were giants in the earth in those days and also afterwards. And also afterwards. So in other words, in those days are the days before the, before the flood came and destroyed them all. Afterwards, it's after the flood. After the flood, there was another eruption of angels coming to the daughters of men, and guess what? This time they produced the Anakims, the Rephaims. They're all from the stock of Nephilim. And who did God raise to stop them, to, to exterminate these giants? Israel. Where were these giants concentrated on? The devil knew the significance of the land of Israel. They were there as the Canaanites. When God told Abraham to go to the land, the Bible says this very, very uh, appropriately. The Canaanites were already in the land. They were squatters on God's promised land to Abraham. They were there to stop the promise from coming to pass. All right? So there was an eruption of this Angels coming to the daughters of men before the flood. The flood took them all away. And there was another one, another eruption after the flood. This one got used Israel. David killed Goliath. Goliath was a giant of the Philistines. Many a time, the Bible would describe things like they are, they are strong, enormous in size and height. Some of them have 11 fingers, 11 toes. Don't look around, okay? There are, no, there are no, no giants around us today. Any resemblance is purely coincidental. But they were there in those days. And God raised Israel to exterminate them. Why, why didn't God send another flood? Because you all know the story. God promised Noah no more flood. Right? So when that, the devil heard that, the devil was rejoicing because he said, I can have another eruption of my angels coming on the daughters of men, and this time there'll be no flood. But then God raised Israel. Amen. Are you with me so far? Amen. All right, let's go back. Genesis 6. I love you all. You all understand. 
Verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. By the way, the angels didn't help Noah build the ark. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Verse 7. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. You must understand, by now the eruption was such that it covered the entire world. After hundreds and hundreds of years, all the world were, were men who were actually, they are men still, but they are perverted men. Half angels, half human. And their thoughts are evil continually. All right? But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I said, Noah found grace. This is the first mention of grace in the Bible, and it says Noah found grace. So you dig deeper. Why, what finds grace in the eyes of the Lord? Noah. What's the meaning of Noah? Rest. Noah means rest. Rest finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. Some people have this idea, all right, grace, is, grace is only, can only be there on someone when they are full of sin. Okay, even though that truth is there, that where sin increased, grace superabounds, someone who is never sinned like Jesus can be full of grace. Why? He's full of rest. When you're full of rest, you're full of grace. Are you with me so far? I thought I'd throw that in. Look at verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. I must show you this, 2 Peter chapter 2, about the fallen angels. 2 Peter 2, he talks about this. For if God did not spare the angels who sin, some people say, well, Pastor Prince, these are the, uh, the angels that sinned when Lucifer fell. Well, keep on reading. But God cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world. Ah, context. Context is king. The context here is not talking about Lucifer's fall in those early days, all right, in the beginning. It's talking about Noah's time. These angels that are bound in hell today are bound in chains of everlasting, uh, 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 chains of darkness. And the word hell here is used only one time in the entire New Testament. Every time you see hell, it's Sheol, Sheol, Gehenna. But this one here is Tartarus, which is only used one time. That means the fallen angels, they were judged early. Compared to all, there are fallen angels right now who are demons. You can't see them. They are the ones instigating you to do wrong. They are the ones bringing problems in your marriage. They are the ones bringing afflictions to your body, disease and sickness. That's why when you use the name of Jesus, many a times you find that the disease leaves. Can I have a good amen? So here it's very clear. And did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of eight people. Noah and Noah's wife. His three sons and their three wives. I don't know, the movie says uh, only one wife. Why don't you just stick to the Bible? I don't understand. Yeah, that's good. You know, the Chinese language is a very old language. The Chinese annals of history talks about the flood. In fact, when they developed their language, the word chuan for boat. Look up here. All right, it has a cho. It has a pa and ko, which makes up boat. Notice, eight people or eight mouths. They describe people as mouth, run, run, ko, right? Run, ko. Eight mouths in a boat. So, eight. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their, their wives. Eight. Amen. Back to Genesis again. All right, so, no, back to uh, 2 Peter, excuse me. So, God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. He wasn't just building. One hand was holding the hammer. The other hand was proclaiming the word of God, telling the people, save yourselves. Judgment is coming. They were laughed at him. It's not like Noah was cruel. Noah was like, hee, 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 I'm going to create no, it was like Noah was preaching to the people and none of them repented. And brought God bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly. 
Go back to Genesis 6. Are you all learning this so far? Are you enjoying it? All right, praise God. This is a genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, righteous man. Now listen, he was a righteous man. He wasn't righteous because of his character. He was righteous because of the blood of the Lamb. Let me prove that to you. Go to Hebrews 11. He prepared, he, he was divinely warned, Noah, by faith, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith, not according to works. So Noah, why did God save Noah and his uh, family? Because they are the only ones who are fully human left after hundreds and hundreds of years, the eruption was almost complete and God had to send the flood, listen carefully, because of His grace and His mercy Amen. so that God can preserve the human race Amen. and God can bring forth the faithfulness of His word that the Messiah will come and crush Satan's head. He who has oppressed and bullied mankind, Jesus will come and crush him. Amen. Are you with me so far? When you understand that, you see the mercy of God. You see the love of God. Amen. Go back to Genesis. All right? So he was a righteous man. Righteous by how? By faith. But you say, Pastor, he says perfect in his generations. Uh-huh. The word perfect, unfortunately, it says perfect here in the King James, New King James. The word perfect here is the word tamim in Hebrew, which is always used for a lamb to be sacrificed. It means the lamb is without blemish. The lamb has no blemish. It refers to the physical body of Noah. There was no taint of in, fall, the fallen angel in his body. In other words, Noah was the only family, pure human race. They are the only hope left. And God saved them all in the ark. Can you understand that now? Can you understand the grace of God? Thank God, God preserved the human race. Amen? Amen? And from, and let's go on. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. And from Shem, Ham, Japheth came all the races of the world. Just let you know something. This is scientifically proven. All races come from one pair of man and woman. Whether you're Chinese, Indian, or whatever, the Bible says God made everyone from one pair, Adam and Eve. And that's why all the dogs varieties in the world, I don't know, maybe over, over 200 varieties of dogs in the world, plus the uh, jackal and plus the wolf and plus the... And all dogs come from one pair of dogs originally in Noah's land. Noah did not bring all the species of dogs, <laughs> all the different pedigrees into the ark. Number one, he brought them two by two. I shouldn't say brought them. God brought them to Noah. Read carefully. All right, they, they came to Noah in the ark. There is something about animals that science cannot explain until today. Two things about animals that we know happen in Noah's ark. Number one, they are migratory instinct. Science cannot explain. How come an arctic turn, the birds, let's be the birds, as well as Butterflies. There's a butterfly called Painted Lady Butterfly. All right. Um, it flies from even Iceland when it gets really cold. Or Europe during the winter months. It will fly thousands and thousands of miles all the way to Africa. In a certain place, you can see all of them collected there. During the winter months, it will spend its warm days in Africa, North Africa. After which, listen they will fly back. Not the original butterflies, they are young, will fly back. The parents died. The parents' days are quite numbered. The young will fly back exactly back to the location where the parents flew from. Do butterflies have brains? <laughs> Yet God leads them. Now, people don't say, it's a migratory instinct. They don't like to acknowledge God. They'll say, Mother Nature. What Mother Nature? Father God. They will say anything but God. Like when Hollywood produced the movies, it's always glorifying men, never glorifying God. 
That's why when you want, want to watch your Bible movies, make sure it's done by people who are born again. Because what river, it's not just the water you drink, it's from which source. Okay, come on. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Next. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. This word corrupt is the same word destroy, later on. Same Greek word, I mean, same, sorry, Hebrew, shakat. All flesh had destroyed their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will shakat, I will corrupt, I will destroy them with the, with the earth. Next verse. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. So God told Noah, this is the grace and the mercy part. God always, God always prepares his people before the crisis. All right, don't forget, Noah's ark is God's idea, not Noah's idea. Noah said, hmm, I think I'll build my ark. No, no, it was God's idea. I'm sending the flood, make yourself, that's grace. An ark of gopher wood. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Cover it inside and outside with pitch. Now, in the Hebrew, it's very interesting. Pitch, by the way, is asphalt, the same thing that you use for your roads. You know, the tar is very sticky, and that's the super glue of the, the wood that was used for the ark. Okay, asphalt. Now, in the Hebrew, literally, the word cover is kafar, it inside and outside with kofer. It's a play on words. And you know that pitch in the Hebrew is called zetet. It is not called kafar. Kafar is the word used for atonement. The word used for covering your sins. Isn't it interesting? From here, God is telling us that Noah's ark is a type of his son, Jesus Christ. We see the word atone, cover. Cover what? Not just outside, from the attacks outside, within, even your own sins. You are covered all around. Amen. So Noah's ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. I'm sure Jesus, when he, when he rose from the dead in the Emmaus walk, where he opened up the Bible concerning himself to the two disciples, I'm sure when he came to Noah's ark, he smiled and said, I am that ark. The ark suffered the divine, the, 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 the ferocious divine anger against all lawlessness and the wickedness that his fallen angels have brought about on man and man's wickedness in yielding to them. The ferociousness and the divine fierceness of God's anger hit the ark. But not one wave of judgment rich Noah. Amen. Can you understand? There's a verse in Psalms 42 that says, the Messiah saying, Jesus on the cross saying, all thy waves and thy billows roll over me. It ro came on him, but it never touched us. He took it for us. Amen. Come on, give him praise. Come on, hallelujah. <laughs> Look at a picture of Noah's ark up here. And that God did something. God says, put the windows above. All right? Make, you shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above. And all around is the window. Look, look at, the, at the picture of the ark again. Can you see the windows all around? Okay? So in other words, God says the, the ventilation and the, 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 the light comes in from the windows. Okay? Why didn't God put windows on the side? All normal... Uh, Vessel do that. By the way, the shape, the length, the height, and all that is almost akin to the Titanic, which is considered the largest ship ever built. Ship builders say it's very much like Titanic. Man builds it, it sank. When God builds it, you can rest. Amen. Who is building your house? So why didn't put windows around? God doesn't want you occupied with all the destruction and, the, and the, the corruption of the world. He wants you looking up to him all the time. Just like the children of Israel in the wilderness during the 40 years. 
they march. Every time they march, when, you know, we think they're marching in the hot sun. No, there was a air conditioning going on, pillar of cloud that covered the sun. They only had to keep their eyes on Jehovah. They only had to keep their eyes on God. God will keep his eyes on their enemies, on the serpents, and all the, the vicissitudes of that journey. At night, when it gets really cold in the desert, God appears as a pillar of fire, a heater. So they always kept cool. So we only have to keep our eyes on him and he provides for us. The devil wants you, look around, look around, look around. No, friend, don't look around. You look around, you'll be distressed. Then they will say, okay, don't look around. Look inside, look inside you. Look at your thoughts. Look at your emotions. Call yourself a Christian. No, don't look within and be depressed. Don't look around and be distressed. Look to Jesus and be at rest. The devil will make you look around or within you except to look up. And by the way, you know who shut the door when the time came? The movie says Noah was fighting until the last moment. <laughs> and Noah shut the door. But my Bible says, look at here in, in uh, Genesis uh, 7, all right? Drop down, drop down. Verse 15, they went into the ark to Noah two by two of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. God is Elohim in Hebrew. Elohim is the creator. Your friends, your colleagues don't know him. If they believe in him, they say God. They say God. They do not know him as, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut him in. The door wasn't closed by Noah or his sons. God closed the door. Amen. When God closed the door, you are safe inside. Right. When God closed the door, no one can unclose. Amen. You are safe. No one can drag you up into the waters of judgment. No one. No preacher, no demon, no deacon. <laughs> you are eternally secure in Christ. Amen. Sometimes the waves get a bit, a bit bumpy. Just like when you are in the plane, all right? Fasten your seatbelts. We are in for a bumpy ride. It will last for about 10 minutes, right? So I'm sure maybe, you know, the, the, some parts of the journey, it got a bit bumpy, and Noah fell. When Noah fell, Noah fell where? Outside the ark or in the ark? Listen, you are in Christ. Even when you fall, you fall in the ark. You don't fall out of the ark. 